and gentlemen, the hungry eyes of great pride in presenting America's youngest elder statesman, Mark <laughs> Shaw. Here we are on the new frontier, right? Cuba. Uh, <laughs> to take this step by step, actually what I plan to do is open up tonight and say, welcome to our regional meeting of the John Birch Society. So <laughs> <what's>, <laughs> but I, <laughs> anyway. So, we have a red carpet now, which we didn't used to have. Uh, to put your minds at ease about all the anxieties, you came out on Academy Award night, which is fantastic. And, uh, <laughs> I'm overcome, and I, uh, I listen to it on the radio, uh, which is more digestible, and the only picture, the only, the pictures, the one raw picture is, you know, Elmer Gantry, and, uh, which is a religious picture, and uh, it's just, that's for all the, uh, all the people in Berkeley who used to say, uh, I'm not really an atheist, I believe in a greater power, it's probably electricity here. <laughs> so, uh, we have a Department of Power and Light, so you can pay homage in your own way, if you're a deist. Anyway, so, uh, not to digress. Now then, uh, to get back to, so the, uh, the only picture that uh, did not win anything of the big pictures um, was a picture called, well, no, there were two, the Alamo, uh, which, as you know, uh, was, uh, you know, put to the people in Hollywood who voted in the Academy on a basis of Americanism. Uh, <laughs> All bad pictures end in O, if you'd like a generalization, like <laughs> Alamo, Gorgo, Vertigo, Psycho, and so forth. And uh, that actually is derivative of another generalization, which had to do with a picture that did not win, called uh, Exodus, if you may recall, uh, which uh, was uh, picketed by the American Legion because it was written by Dalton Trumbo, who's not approved of by the American Legion. So they picketed that. They also picketed Spartacus, which he wrote too. <laughs> And uh, so again, we have to generalize and say the American Legion will pick it Exodus Spartacus and any other picture that ends in U.S. <laughs> All right, now. So, the picture is three hours and 47 minutes long, which prompted Mr. Kane to say that it's long even if you're Jewish. <laughs> so you can... <laughs> turn to the usher and say, let my people go. That's okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> now just, I just want to clear up this news. The, in, uh, the invasion of Cuba is on. You may have learned this from the paper or a, a handout from one of our advertising agencies, <laughs> depending on your uh, liaison. However, uh, the, uh, now this afternoon, as you know, Fidel Castro, uh, I knew that this was coming. I worked in Miami just a couple of months ago at the Americana Hotel, and uh, while I was down there, people would stand on the beach, you know, and although they were still wearing those matching uh, terry cloth shirts and shorts and gay and festive designs, uh, somehow there's a lack of vigor about the celebration because, uh, you know, a lot of the yeah, male guests at the hotel had sent their wives and children home, and you know, something doing. And, uh, it's that, uh, they used to say to me, you can see the island. You know, he's a real threat, Castro, because you can see the island. And uh, I used to look and I'd say, well, I can't see it. And then people would say, so help me. They'd say, well, it's right behind that aircraft carrier. <laughs> well. So. <laughs> well, this afternoon, after all these charges against President Kennedy, um, about by Fidel Castro's government, uh, our ambassador to the United Nations, Adlai Stevenson, uh, categorically denied American participation in this invasion, and uh, he made a speech in the UN, and he said that if Castro, uh, you know, Castro can't look to our government for help if he has been rejected by his own people. <laughs> right? And uh, Stevenson should know, so I... Uh, your <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's a lonely role. Uh, Stevenson, the official line of the party is that Stevenson never had it, but Kennedy has magic. That's the official view now. Uh, and then they give you various examples. They say, uh, wherever Kennedy goes, he's very popular with women. He's a handsome man, 
and that often the Secret Service people have to stop the car and they say, Mr. President, our progress has been impeded until we remove the girl that's under our front bumper. Right? <laughs> and then as I understand that they pull the girl out who's usually delirious by then because of Kennedy and she's yelling, I touched him, I touched him. See? And uh, if you recall, Stevenson never elicited that passionate a response. <laughs> I think because people thought he was the perpetual candidate of the Democratic Party. You know, so it's got to be a more patient thing, like, you know, uh, did you touch him? No, I'll touch him next time. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? So, uh, as you know, uh, a few remarks have gotten into the press about wh what I've said about the new frontier, as I said earlier. And a lot of people haven't known what to make me. The Democrats, as a matter of fact, feel completely misled by me. Uh, because I used to uh, criticize uh, President Eisenhower and Richard Nixon, and uh, now I'm uh, saying a few words about uh, President Kennedy and his administration, and the Democrats feel that they were misled, you know, uh, they, or I misled them. I could say the same thing, but I won't tonight. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm being facetious. I think, uh, but Democrats, uh, they didn't know what to make of me, because initially, uh, you know, there was, uh, I was kidding about President Eisenhower, and then I, I kind of kidded Nixon for seven and a half years, which is approximately uh, seven years and two months longer than Kennedy uh, kidded him. And then, so, but that doesn't matter, you know. And then uh, after that, after the election, I immediately, uh, you know, was going ahead with the material. And I'd be up on the stage in various clubs, whether it was Basin Street in New York, or uh, the Crescendo in Hollywood, or uh, the Americana Miami, or, or I mean the, uh, the Fontainebleau was. But it doesn't matter. I'd get up and I'd say the same thing. You know, I had all the jokes ready. Oh, actually, I thought Kennedy was going to look about uh, his father coming out the next day in disenchantment and uh, saying, uh, what's happened to our values? Uh, does money mean nothing? That's, see, so that's what I was working on. Well, uh, so I did all these jokes. Now, now the Democrats are coming backstage. You know, they come back in committee because they're really, you know, the ruling party now. And they come backstage and they say to me, uh, well, you just criticized President Kennedy. And I'd say, yeah, that's right, that was me. And then they'd say, well, you know, we're appalled. We, we thought this was what you wanted. See? So I'd be forced to say, you didn't have to do it for me. <laughs> now, since then, <laughs> since then, we have a royal family. See, we have, uh, we've got a royal family at this late date. And I can't pick up a magazine without reading about Jacqueline Kennedy or reading about Carolyn Kennedy and the Whirling Blades, the helicopter, or an eagle tried to abscond with a child, or the Cubans were going to kidnap her, ye godzels. And uh, then for a while, the Secret Service got some wild idea a couple of weeks ago that the Cubans uh, were going to assassinate all the Kennedy, claiming they had insufficient ammunition. Remember that? Remember? So, <laughs> oh. unbelievable. And uh, Eisenhower has said nothing except to praise President Kennedy. Remember, he praised him. And uh, then he said that the, uh, the man in space didn't uh, amaze him any. He wasn't surprised. So, uh, I, I, and, uh, okay, so I'm coming to that in a minute. <laughs> his first solo flight, right? Will he make good in the eyes of his instructor? So, <laughs> all right, well, back to that. So, and meanwhile, then. So it's been, anyway, it's been practically brainwashing for me. Everywhere I've turned, President Kennedy has been on television. Now, he had a press conference today, and then uh, he will be on uh, Thursday, and then he'll be on with the press conference against Monday, uh, but you have the weekend to yourselves. That's the latest. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what is this? What is, well, we're keeping the people informed. And uh, so in order, you have to kind of review this to see what our relative progress is. Now, if Kennedy stays on television, Bob Sarnoff, this is really a test of democracy. Bob Sarnoff, who is uh, president of NBC, said, uh, it's an economic fact of life that we can't carry these press conferences. We're losing sponsorship and billing. So we would like the president to have a sponsor. For instance, the report on his first 100 days, or his first 82 days, uh, was on ABC, and it was sponsored by Crest Toothpaste. So they want to have a sponsor, see? So uh, I got to thinking about this, whether or not they would censor the president then. You know, he'd have to clear his material and uh, say, you know, may I mention the United States? No, that's a plug in your mouth. <laughs> well, it's really depressing, I mean, this aspect. Now, I know about television because I've really gone into the arena of mass media, you know, this year especially. Now, uh, since the election, I've been on the following shows, and although there hasn't been overt censorship, 
Um, I had to avoid that catastrophe once by walking off a show, which I want to tell you about. This started, uh, I'll give you a review of the kind of television shows I've been doing and then you'll know, see. I worked at the Masonic Temple, I went to Los Angeles, and I was immediately cast on a television program starring Milton Berle, but there are no more comedy shows. So he has a sports show called Jackpot Bowling. So uh, because I'm a trooper, I went to this bowling alley, you know? And uh, I went in there, and it was a, they have a bowling alley in the middle of Hollywood, which is owned by the American Legion. It's called the Hollywood Legion Lanes, oddly enough. And I walk in there, and uh, it's a bowling alley like any other. A lot of gangsters hanging around who tried to get me to throw this bowling match. That's what goes on. <laughs> These guys are all from Las Vegas. And that's the, uh, they're members of the syndicate, I believe it's called. And uh, they're being, that's the kind of thing that the Attorney General is trying to fight. The Attorney General, as you recall, is the President's younger brother. And, uh... I initially was cynical about this appointment until I saw him in action, and the last time we met, I was dropping a lot of skeptical lines like, uh, you know, promise them anything but give them your brother. Remember I used to say that? No, I did, because I watched him, Bobby Kennedy, working hand in hand with J. Edgar Hoover, which, uh, <laughs> so, now we have this 35 years old, he's the head of all law enforcement, right? Little brother is watching you on high, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> So I'm on television, see, I'm at the bowling program, and it's a, a bowling alley, except it's a Hollywood bowling alley, and there's no aircraft workers, a lot of stuff, like, I watched one guy, made a $750 bowling, made a strike, so uh, everybody was elevating him on their shoulders and everything, and his wife kept saying to him, I can't share this with you, this jubilation, because you're a bowling champion, but I'm nothing, see, I have no identity, it's a common problem, American women, I understand, so then the guy said to her, you'd better grow with me or you'll lose me. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So then she tried bowling, and then he accused her of being competitive, and she was crying and everything. <laughs> interesting, huh? So then I left. I left the bowling alley, and uh, I went home, and then uh, I uh, was reading then that the uh, uh, president was appointing people. That's what was going on then. And he was appointing uh, those people from Harvard, as you recall. And uh, <laughs> no Yale people there. It's all those people from Harvard. The new commissioner of Indian Affairs is my former homeroom teacher who has, right? Okay. So this is still, right? Galbraith. And Schlesinger, and these guys are really intellectuals, you know, but Schlesinger is the one who wrote, uh, he's a history professor, you know, and he wrote the statement against Castro, you know, uh, let your people out of the chains and all that, and he is uh, a Harvard intellectual, as I say, which is different than Castro's motivation, that's the lack of communication, because uh, look at this disparity here, if you take, you take a guy like Castro, to oversimplify, and you take him out of law school, the University of Havana, and you send him into the hills, he'll organize a revolution, so you have that. Now you take a guy like, uh, you know, who's a, in the law school at Harvard, and uh, take him out of school and send him into the hills, what will he do? Well, he'll subdivide, and then, <laughs> and that, right? That's what I got. So, this is the same thing, see, it's the same thing as with Kennedy and Bob Sarnoff. Now look at that disparity. Here's a, a, a kind of a dichotomy, to oversimplify again. You've got, uh, You've got, uh, uh, like, Sarnoff is a Republican, he has a lot of money, and he goes into his father's business. It's just expected, you know. Kennedy is a Democrat with a lot of money, and he goes into government, right? And then you hope that his father is not in his business, or you, you know? So, all right, so uh, we'll withhold judgment on that joke until later. <laughs> all right, now, now I leave the bowling alley and I go home, and uh, I get a call from NBC. You know, I get all the weirdo calls. They want to do a program, uh, they have a program called The Nation's Future on Saturday nights in which they debate things. I think you've seen it. It's an hour in color. Public affairs, you know, which means they have the dullest producers. And it, uh, so he says, it's in the Nixon-Kennedy tradition, whatever that means, you know. So he said, you want to debate? I said, yeah, because I was on a debate squad at Cal. You know, very big on debate. And we flew all over Northern California. That'll give you an idea. And uh, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to debate other schools. You know, it's pretty exciting. So... Uh, <laughs> Great, I'm gonna do it. So I said, what are we gonna debate? He said, well, uh, I said, what's the show like? He said, well, watch it. So I watched it for two weeks and uh, had different people. Like one night they had uh, an argument about economy between uh, Burrell from the State Department, A.A. Burrell, and Che Guevara, who was president of the Cuban National Bank. <laughs> so I was really tempted to say Che's National Bank, but I didn't, you know. So, so, yeah, I do that every once in a while. I crack, you know, with a pun. So uh, then I had, what else? Oh. And then, then we, uh, one week they had the Soapy Williams on arguing with the housing administrator of Nigeria, you know. <laughs> Soapy Williams, you like that appointment? So it's another one of the, the able people on the frontier who don't, don't seem to include Hubert Humphrey or, or uh, Symington or anybody else who ran in the primaries. 
but I'll, uh, <laughs> oh boy. So uh, as Bobby Kennedy said, I'll get you. I think that was the rumored threat. And that's, at least that's one campaign promise that was kept, if not, all right. So, that's weird. So, here we are now, uh, we're going to do the program, it's a debate, and it's going to be about censorship. Well, you know, that's my meat. We're going to talk about what taboos are actually on television. So I found out I'm going to debate with Steve Allen. So I go to the studio, and Steve Allen is walking around there, and he's got, uh, as you know, he retired from television a year ago. Many of his alumni have been here at the Hungry Eye, and uh, he, uh, he's retired. He's becoming an intellectual, Steve Allen. He's reading all the time, and he's insane nuclear policy, and he's in pacifist groups. He's got a big thing, you know, about exploring his mind. So I come to the studio, and he's got three books he's carrying. First of all, he's eating mounds to keep his energy up. <laughs> Did you ever see those? They're, they're advertised on television. You have a guy who holds these candy bars, and he says something about, uh, I ate one, but I still have one left. It's a great discovery. And it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a shredded coconut bar, and a lot of used car dealers, you know, when a car needs rings, they put mounds in a crankcase. Uh, okay. Just to get our values correct tonight. Now, we're going in the air, and Steve Allen is walking around. He's reading Walter Lippmann's preface to morals. And he's reading uh, a book by Sandberg called The History of the Prairie, which tells a lot of things we didn't know up to now. Uh, for instance, the first settler in what became Chicago, first guy who stopped in the prairie and had the guts to try and stake something out in this empire, uh, was a Negro. That isn't generally accepted in the history books. And uh, <laughs> that's, that really jars you a little, doesn't it? And uh, I, I expect to read now that uh, a white man moved in alongside him shortly thereafter and property values skyrocketed. <laughs> Great. So, uh, Steve is reading, and uh, you know, so a lot of us, you know, we were doing what people do on a television set. We, you know, you talk about guys who are talking about their kids and why you ride a bike for exercise. And some of us were Indian wrestling on the piano, and uh, one of the cameramen put his fists up, and I was hitting them, kind of working out there. You know how you like to do, and uh, you try to keep busy and occupied. And then, uh, even though you have all these adult tasks to occupy you, you know how annoying it can be when a guy's reading kind of bothers you. So. Some of us went over there to kind of kid him, you know, no, nothing and no offense intended, just kid him a little, you know, so we kicked his chair and everything while he was trying to read, and uh, it was great, and then we turned the light out and he got mad and everything, it was a lot of fun, and then we knocked the book out of his hand, he really, he really got bugged with that, I remember that, and especially, and then we took the book away, we started to play catch with it in the studio, well, he was really angry, and uh, then uh, one of us dropped it in this water, and he got sore, and, uh, you know, and because uh, he couldn't take a joke, so then... I figured if he's going to be mad, he'll make a big scene. So I thought I'd use a little psychology on him and bring him into the group. So I said, why do you read all those books about great men? He said accusingly. So Steve said, because you learn a lesson of humility, which is the greatest lesson one can learn. So I said, really? He said, yeah, think of a great man, and I'll tell you the way in which he was humble. So now I'm stumped. I'm trying to think of a great man. Everybody I think of was either in the army or uh, in business, and I can't think of it. So, uh, and besides, it's very hard to think on a set because all these guys are Indian wrestling and hitting each other's fists. And, all, you know, you can't think. So... I uh, called the assistant producer and I said, listen, can I go in one of the conference rooms that the sponsors, representatives use? And maybe I can think of something. So he let me in this room and I have these brainstorming pads there for advertising men and water pitchers and all. And it's quiet, you know. And they have uh, erasers and a blackboard. You get your ideas doped out there. So I was in there for a while and uh, I thought of a great man and then I uh, rang the buzzer they have so that someone would let me out. <laughs> And I went out, page boy let me out, and I said, I thought of a great man, Steve. So he said, go, you know, because he's a very fast little guy. And I said, uh, Albert Einstein. I figured that's safe, you know. So uh, he said, uh, Albert Einstein used to answer all his own phone calls, which really, you know, got to me as the, the modesty of the man. Uh, now, of course, later on, I'm driving home reevaluating. I'm thinking, you know, whoever called Einstein, <laughs> right? <laughs> I uh, believe Steve Allen did. Uh, <laughs> I'm not mistaken. All right, now we're on the air. Everybody's yelling 30 seconds and everything. He said, uh, gentlemen, we're going to start our debate. So we go on the air and uh, the moderator says, the nation's future. Tonight we're debating in the Nixon-Kennedy tradition. So I move my lectern closer to Steve's. <laughs> and uh, we start in. Well, you know what the premise is? Resolved. Uh, you know, are there any taboos on TV for comedians? Opening statement, me, right away, camera one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, there are taboos, but I'm not allowed to mention them on this network. <laughs> so the show is really going downhill. It's really dull city, you know. 
and uh, it was boring, and people were calling in questions, and uh, it's a live show, and you have all these these chicks, you know, that work for the producer, these Trotskyite girls they have, you know, <laughs> we're always saying, you know, straighten your tie, and they can see your socks, and uh, uh, speed it up, and your right rear wheel is on fire, you know, signs, and bring home a bread, and other, you know, <laughs> really drive you out of your head. So we go off the air, and the producer says, well, he says, I don't think that it was, uh, I don't think it was really in the Nixon-Kennedy, here we go again, you know, their tradition. So he says, uh, you know, that's not a real debate. So I was really bugged because I know what debate is. So I started to really drive the guy into the ground. And I said, I was on a debate squad at Cal. So he says, well, maybe this was too tough a proposition. Not at all. Because we really had tough propositions. And a teacher would often try to test your mettle by giving you an impossible proposition. You know, resolve, uh, jet planes are better transportation than a dog sled. A, uh, <laughs> a 707. Uh, can cross the continent with 142 people in living room comfort and relative safety in five hours. Thank you. And now the rebuttal for dog sleds. <laughs> well, may I ask my worthy opponent if an aeroplane is loyal? So, now we're off the air, see, and about, I go home and I get a call now because we've come to the new year and the inauguration is with us, and I get a call uh, to go to Florida <laughs> to work at the Fontainebleau Hotel for an entertainer who's been tapped by the president to go to the gala. You remember that? The gala was a show produced by Frank Sinatra and the Summit Group for, <laughs> for President Kennedy. And uh, this show was, uh, as you, everybody expected them to show up at the, at the Eichmann trial. I was waiting for that. I, they didn't get there. Uh, so, the gala. So we're going. Uh, now, I had to, uh, Frank, later on, you know, that kept coming up. Wherever I worked, people have said, what's uh, Sinatra's tie with the Kennedy administration? What's his payoff? And that would force me to ask in turn to the hecklers, uh, you know, what does he need? <laughs> or uh, repeal of the Mann Act. Just think about that. No. <laughs> so I thought of it. Take your car to Vegas with you or something. So onward. Well, so I have to go to Florida. See, it was great. So I'm off to Florida, and uh, that's where I ran into all the action with Castro. See, so I thought it'd be good to get to the East Coast, and uh, there might be the pressure of a Cuban invasion, but at least I'll, you know, it'll be a break from the tension out here from the Red Chinese thing in California. <laughs> the Birch Society. And uh, as you know, meanwhile, out here, of course, the, uh, the lady who runs the Communist Party uh, came here, and uh, the, uh, Mrs. Flynn, and she was here in San Francisco, you recall, and referred to Laos as an island. Remember that? Which sent the press into a tizzy. Not that. But they think Formosa is a continent. That's all right. right? <laughs> okay, just checking. <laughs> Unbelievable. So uh, I thought it was very clever, the way she looked, you know, uh, kind of down at the heels. Very clever, misleading. And uh, it's kind of counter Mr. Welch. We're caught in between, those of us who are uncommitted. So, uh, <laughs> have a bonbon. What kind of candy did he make? Right? No? Okay. So, did he have somebody taste it for him first? <laughs> okay, onward. Now, where am I? Oh, so I'm off to Florida. Now, in going to Florida, I, uh, I flew on an airplane, uh, which is of no consequence, except. I really am getting tired of the panic on airplanes. I really had it. I think people are panicked on airplanes because they hear comedians joking about it all the time. They think that it's in, you know, fashionable. And uh, secondly, it's like there's some people who don't learn anything. A neurotic, a sure sign of a neurotic, is when they keep complaining about the same thing every season. You know, it's hot every summer. Yes, are you surprised? You know, or uh, gee, there's a blizzard in New York. Yes, that's right. And uh, you know, there's a fire in Laurel Canyon. Yes, we know there usually is. And uh, the other one is airplanes aren't safe. Yes, I know, but. Let's go, you know, it's the American date with destiny. So, I get to the airport and there's a bomb scare. See, there's a guy who said he's gonna plant a bomb in the plane. And uh, as you know, that's against federal law. If you give <laughs> yeah, no, it's, if you say you're gonna plant it and you don't, that's against the law. So, so you know, you really have to follow through. <laughs> So we get up, now I'm on the plane, they're looking for a bomb and everybody's lunch and all that. So now we've taken off and they've got this flight to Miami and because of some politics within the civil aeronautics, well anyway, to Miami, as you know, you have to go, uh, they take this plane and they say, uh, you're landing in Dallas, then you're landing in New Orleans, then you go to Miami and it becomes, it starts as American Airlines and then it becomes National and Delta, see? And 
that. It's the same plane. You know, they don't even spray it. Nothing. There's, there's, and there's a great chick on it. You know, American Airlines, good dame. You know, great. And they really, and a really sensible skirt length, you know, is really rigid, regardless of, well, you know, I mean, they don't go with that thing. It's up and down and trying to prove points. But, you know, anyway. So, uh, and, uh, but I mean, they don't dress all out for guys like a chick would in Los Angeles, and they don't dress for other women, which is the dullest, the way a lot of them do up here. But it was, anyway, it was good. So, these are my real values, by the way, but that's like, nobody knows. They think I'm an intellectual, which is largely publicity. So, <laughs> I'm a living example of how you can mislead people, right? Okay, so, great. Well, as a result, that's another thing I have against this administration. Before we had a 43-year-old president, you know, we used to have people used to come up to me and say, how dare you criticize the administration nightclub? I happen to agree with a lot of your tenets in principle, but good Lord, what right do you have in a saloon? Who are you, right? Now Kennedy's elected and people are coming up to me and saying, you're a bright young guy. It's amazing you're not in the government. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be connected with a government that would have me in it. I really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're back in the plane with this girl, see? So she's, it's great. So she's serving, she serves dinner, you know? And uh, when it gets to be National Airlines, she serves a snack. And then when it's Delta Airlines, she's serving like, you know, this sandwich. And not only that, but I don't know, she doesn't really try as hard later. And she's kind of, uh, I don't know, she kind of gets within herself. She didn't look too great toward the end of the flight. I was like, <laughs> said, what? really? I said, aren't you going to eat? No, I'm not hungry. You know, it's kind of that resentment, you know. So uh, now I'm coming. So now we're coming in, and we can't land in Florida because these Cuban refugees are arriving. All of whom think they're coming over here, you know, to go on a lecture tour about the evils of communism. When they get here, are offered jobs at half of union scale, spraying lemons, you know. Nice. So we come. And now I'm I can't land. So he says we're diverting to West Palm Beach. But now my ears go up right away. You know, maybe I'm going to see the man. You know, that'd be kind of great. I'd like to see him in person. So great. Okay. So uh, we're diverting. He says on the PA system. Now uh, he's got to come in. I know that the West Palm Beach runway is 3,500 feet long. See, this is a 707. So uh, I'm a little panicked. I see the other people in the plane, you know, are, are talking to their children, their wives, and everything. But see, being an intellectual, all, I don't have those relationships. I kind of, you know, uh, rejoice in statistics. And all <laughs> so uh, I don't need anybody. So uh, okay, now we're coming. I'm going to land now, and I'm wondering about how he's going to get in this runway. So. They, these guys know what they're doing. You know, I would never go along with the popular humor, you know, to uh, say pilots on what they're pretty hip guys. They know what's going on. And, uh, you know, that's why they're up front. I, I really believe in it. <laughs> so now he's coming in, and he's coming over the fence at about 140 knots. See? So I know what he's going to do. See, they keep their throttles wide open so that he can always take it. And he can. So, uh, in other words, he's kind of hanging there. He's, like, he's got all full speed. He has to. So we're cooling now. And he, if he wants to stop, he can uh, reverse thrust. And uh, is a parachute that can send out the drag your feet if you'd like. Right? <laughs> Participating at the group level. That's his thing. <laughs> so I know this is going to be grim because the guy who runs you know, the Hertz thing over there, Hertz cars, he's standing out there with a fire extinguisher. Good? Right? Right? Really worried, see? I stand there and uh, I really am. So sit down, buck up. The pilot is going to be a little choppy, folks. So everybody's scared, but I don't know if I can convey this to you. They're not really scared because they're acting the way people do in the movies. I was in the service, and when I was in the service, people who were scared were really petrified. They didn't say anything, you know. And uh, these people are all talking in the plane. They're all talking, you know, and uh, they're saying things that are expected of them in motion pictures. You know, guys are turning to uh, women and they're saying, "Well, I never thought it would be come this way." And uh, I saw a guy turn to his son and he said, "You're the man in the family now, Jimmy," and all this. You know, <laughs> Yeah, this chick turns to me and she says, I never saw Paris, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're like this. Hokey, huh? So he, so he climbed about 120 knots, so he gives us to go up and make another pass, see? Now, the second time, it's Panic City, because everybody kept quiet. You didn't hear a sound in there. It was like church in the cabin, you know? Except for the businessmen cracking air travel cards. <laughs> right? Yeah. So now I get out of the plane, right? 
and Kennedy's DC-6, you know, his Convair is sitting there, the Caroline. So, uh, you know who that is, right, folks? She's <laughs> gonna have a magazine of her own. Does she want that Rooner as a child? Well, so, no, this is great. So, uh, we're gonna go see the press. So we go down and we rent a car from Hertz, and we get, and, uh, regardless of the Peanuts ad, so we're driving, we're driving up the highway on Biscayne Boulevard, and, you know, I'm very status-ridden about cars. I really think they say a lot about a man. Uh, so then, you know, stopping at lights and saying to people, it's not mine, you know, which... <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. And then, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because they don't care. It's like, it's typical of the same kind of principle in Hollywood when a starlet and a young star get married in secret, but nobody cares anyway. You know that thing? All right. So now I'm, uh, I'm driving to Palm Beach. I get up there. There's only 1,500 other people with the same idea. Now, why do they go up there? They go up there on Sunday because they know that of all the times the president might be on vacation, that he will get, come out to go to church at 9 o'clock. See, they know he's going to come out to go. And uh, this, has, this must not smack of discrimination or anything, or any form of bigotry. It's that they know this is a habit pattern. See? So we're all standing out there waiting. And, you know, my mind is twisted anyway. And I'm thinking things like, well, one of the disadvantages of his new job is that he has to get up and go. I'm thinking things like that. <laughs> now he comes out. Nine o'clock, here comes President Kennedy. And he comes running out. And, you know, it's Florida. He's not going to... So he's wearing a sweater and a polo shirt underneath, you know, and a pair of khakis. Why, he looked like one of us. <laughs> but there's something a little different, let's face it. You know, and a guy's up there for a reason. And so he comes running out and he jumps out. He's got a white Pontiac convertible sitting there. And the Secret Service follows him in a black Lincoln limousine. <laughs> so he jumps in the car and he waves. And every one of those 1,500 people, I suppose, thought they were waving at him. That's what they mean by crowd magic. And you'd hear little remarks that, you know, this guy really looks self-reliant. And uh, you'd hear little random remarks saying, well, he wears the mantle of leadership well. And, uh, uh, do I want a president with pipes on his car? I said that. <laughs> I want to check with you and see if it's acceptable first. I mean, uh, yeah. So when I said that, this girl next to me, you know, she heard that, goes, wham! And she says, he's doing that to appeal to guys like you. It's part of being president of all the people. So I said, he is? She said, yeah, he wants to show you he's like you. So of course, inevitably, that leads to the next question. Do I want a president like me? <laughs> <laughs> of course not. You know, people like to dwell in hope. So uh, I don't want a president like me. So any, now he gets in a car, and this is wild. Now, with all this preface of skepticism I've given you and all that, uh, he waved at the crowd, I felt he was waving at me, 1,500 people, and then he took out uh, these big Italian sunglasses, great looking, you know. He took them out, and he put them on, and it was like, it's a strangest reaction, it was, a, it was like a catharsis. <laughs> I mean, to put it simply, it's a college person trying to express himself. Uh, no, it was, it, when he put those sunglasses, unconsciously, I found myself reaching for my sunglasses. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'll be your co-pilot <laughs> on the new frontier. I owe my soul to the company store on the new frontier. So, at the, well, anyway, now, where was I? Oh, so I go down to the hotel to go to work, the Fontainebleau, and I get down there, and it's Panic City. As I say, everybody's worried about the invasion. All. Now the phone rings. See, you're all wondering what this has to do with censorship. I know. Here's, here's the payoff. I'm lying there at the pool with cocoa butter, which annoys all the people there because you use French suntan oil and all that. And, uh, you know, so, but I believe in American products. Hershey cocoa butter. <laughs> they made the chocolate bars we used during the war, fellas. Right? So, uh, <laughs> I'm making my show more colorful. An effort to gain mass acceptance. Everybody can't love you. So, uh, really? So, uh, <laughs> So thou shalt love one another one at a time. That's a command. So now, now willing. So I get to the hotel. The phone rings. I pick up the phone, and it says uh, long distance. Right? Okay. So I'm going to cool it now. Who's calling, operator? New York. All right. Who in New York? Twenty questions. He says. Uh, operator says, David Suskind. <laughs> so I hear this man's voice. You know, kind of arrogant, and he says, Suskind, operator. <laughs> What's your number? So I figured, you know, this chick is really in trouble. 
So uh, I'm trying to talk to her now and tell her, you know, she can always find work and all. We'll take care of it. That's the way show business is. So he gets on the phone and he said, hello. So I said, hello. I want to give this just as it came to me. Give it to you. Hello, hello. And it was one of those long distance things, you know, 1,600 miles. The same way people, uh, you know, when you were nine years old with the coffee cans and the strings, you know. No wonder of communication, right? Nobody has anything to say. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> Agony. So he says, listen, I've got a show for you. I said, really? Yes. Uh, he says, we're going to do a special with Art Carney, and this is up your alley. Political satire. I said, terrific. And I said, I don't have any point of view about the new administration. He said, well, that's all right. We're all waiting to see. But, uh, and that, but nevertheless, we can do a fun-filled show, and this is a special. It's not on every week. It's going to be live. They can't edit the tape. You're in. And Art Carney, and we got a lot of hip writers on the show. This is going to be a winner. we got a great guest list, Lee Remix on the show, and we got liberal sponsors, whatever that means. <laughs> so, all right, I'll come to New York, and I'll do this show. So now I finish at the hotel, and I fly into New York, and I walk into rehearsal, and it looks like a tomb. And the sponsor's lawyers are there. Everybody's there. And uh, they're arguing with Art Carney about this song because he's singing something about integrating his personality. And the sponsor's lawyer says, I wouldn't want to say integrate on the full NBC network. <laughs> so I said, uh, why don't you look at it this way? Uh, the word was with us a long time before the problem. You know? Think of it that way. No, no, no. Now let's look at your material. Well, we've got a sketch. Uh, the sketch opens up and says, uh, we now have a typical American family in Washington, and we don't need to uh, fabricate anymore for television comedy. We have a typical American family, the Kennedys at home. Sketch opens up, and we show the White House, they play da 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 da. Now we come in, and the president walks in. Now, this is the first joke they're arguing about. And his wife says, You're home early today. And the president says, Every day, child labor laws. First joke, see? All right? He says, Can't say that. Why? Treason. Okay? Next joke. <laughs> That's all right, give him a chance. Here's the next joke. Uh, this is about the pace of the sketch, too. He says, uh, <laughs> President Kennedy says, what did you do today, Jacqueline? I went shopping, dear. Oh, really? Yes. I bought a Dior and a Cassini. He says, may I see them? And she says, yes, they're upstairs designing dresses. <laughs> Out. Never. So, uh... So I pull out of the show scene, Jonathan Winters takes over on the show. He's going to do the sketch now. I pull out of the show. Now, this is very unfortunate. First, I got to talk to the lawyers. I figure all is lost. And the lawyers are saying to me, well, you just, you know, the sponsors just won't go along. That's the problem. It's the sponsors. Now, who are the sponsors? Well, the first half hour is sponsored by Sarah Lee Cheesecake. Second half hour is Timex. So I figure I might as well destroy this lawyer. There's nothing left, you know. So I said, uh, what? What, what do you, who do you represent? Timex. Watches. Timex. Really? Who, who are they? Well, uh, so I don't know any jewelers that carry the horse, he says. Hey, no kidding. Yeah. And it's in the window being dunked by William Cameron Menzies. Or something. I said, really? No kidding. So I'm playing it dumb now. I've never seen your art to miss the watch, if you recall it. Here and here, over there. Right? Well, uh, this guy now. So he says to me, any drugstore handles it. So I said, well, can I just go in and ask for it openly? <laughs> Now, the point of this, you know, this agony here, this long story, is that I had hoped all that nonsense had ended with Eisenhower, you know. Now we're in this period of reverence again, and uh, it's a question, you know, of where you can go with it, because the press is on a honeymoon with this administration. And uh, I even find Republicans saying, I'm pretty happy at the way it worked out. <laughs> I'll give you pause for thought if you're in a Democratic council. And uh, we have now, uh, we have this pyramid now, and uh, as I said, these... And before you would kid the new frontier, you would have to scrutinize it. You'd have to examine who he, the president has appointed. And you find, uh, for instance, Edward R. Murrow is a good example. He's head of the United States Information Agency. Uh, he recently said that he would like the president uh, to take, uh, in other words, as a propaganda weapon for the Russians, to drop copies of Life magazine on the Russians. Now, you know, they don't get life or time. See, this goes along with their claim that they are ahead of us in certain areas. <laughs> He wants to, he doesn't want to take every edition. He wants to take the inauguration edition. And have you seen that edition? It's exciting. And uh, it was all gold and it was 50 cents and they happen to have some left over. And, uh, right, George? And uh, they're going to, they want to drop these on the Russians, not in sticks, but separately, of course. That can all be worked out if Congress approves. So, of course, Fulbright and a lot of those guys started asking about it. 
and uh, the, uh, you know, what would happen with it. Now, first of all, can the Russians read the captions? Well, uh, Murrow held that they wouldn't have to. They'd see an inauguration, and they'd know what happens with democracy because it's obvious enough. And uh, they would see the entire inauguration. And there's some great pictures in the issue. If you recall, there's a, uh, a picture of the president with his father, who he was recently reunited with, as you recall. At, remember, he was gone for a long time. And they're, they're riding together in the car. That's where Miss Parsons had said that the, uh, the president looked like a movie star. Is it Judge Hardy and Andy? That's what I kept thinking of. But, oh, I, or, did you read that? She said that he's handsome enough, Kennedy's handsome enough to be a movie star. He retired 51 and go into pictures. And then he could, uh, of course, we could go on all night if we started speculating on what producers would handle him. You know, so, right? so Hitchcock, right? He worked for Hitchcock. And uh, North by Northwest with John Kennedy being pursued across Mount Rushmore, right? <laughs> uh, the head of the House Rules Committee, right? And there uh, are good shots of uh, uh, Kennedy climbing on his own face. That's what knocks me out. <laughs> So the president is riding with his father. Then there are some pictures up in the stand are exciting. For instance, the inaugural parade. You remember the PT boat was in the parade, and uh, a replica. And the president, uh, they're going to do, they're going to do this movie called PT Boat 109. The Japanese officer who destroyed his boat has been found by a true magazine and has been writing a series of articles in which he uh, entitled. I almost killed the man who became president there. And he explains in a text how he just didn't recognize the quality of leadership. You know? <laughs> it's... One of the pictures is when Archbishop Cushing got up to give the invocation. And you recall that there was a, yeah, there was a fire, there were flames. And uh, people said that, I mean, the official reason given was a short circuit. I mean, that's the official reason. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, you may laugh, but I was a skeptic until that moment. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, so, uh, now we have, uh, time also points out that we have two Jewish members of the cabinet. Every week they have something about that. Uh, two Jewish members of the cabinet. And uh, that's without precedent. Kennedy himself said that the American people have a lower threshold of tolerance than they are generally given credit for. That's a term he learned in the psych class, I gather. It's, you like that? It's a lower threshold of tolerance. He could be a uh, you know, Catholic president. He said there'd be a Jewish president within 40 years. By the way, uh, he said that in October. If you want to hold him to it, you might as well. <laughs> you want credit for the time? Sure. You might as well. You know. So uh, it's fun. It's just sort of like... Uh, <laughs> it was like my bitterness with the Eisenhower administration. I used to uh, keep books. I'd go home to my cave, you know, with a rock X. And, uh, you know, looking toward that day of liberation. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, the president is well remembered and was mentioned in a motion picture called The Misfits, as you recall. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe keeps saying, he was never there. He was never there. <laughs> so, sure. Did you know that? That's him. <laughs> I don't see a bunch of people chasing horses. I got more things to worry about now. All right, now where am I? Oh yes, back to truth as we know it. Now, so uh, now Time's biggest romance this week is with the fact that the assistant director of the budget is Jewish, and uh, hate to belabor this fact, but uh, it says immigrant parents. This is really like a bad scenario. It's uh, uh, immigrant parents, and uh, who'd have thought there? You know, they're living in the East Side of New York, and his kid is running errands. And who'd have thought that 20 years later he would be totaling our national budget, right? On a brown paper bag. Thank you. Right? <laughs> right? Thank you. What else, please? <laughs> 500 Polaris missiles as a deterrent to war. Uh, now, where am I? Oh, yes, back to our theme. I'm still looking for a leader. So, uh, <laughs> listen, the Republican Party, uh, you know, it, they're back, uh, a lot of them are back where they're happiest, you know. Uh, not in government, but fighting government. That's their big government. Is it? Yeah, the, the Motorama's on again. I, uh, in fact, I think I'm going to make that uh, my swan song. I want to say one word about our penal system. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's one reason I can never be happy. Everything bothers me. Uh, <laughs> see, our penal system, uh, we're getting weird kind of prisoners now. Uh, some of the new prisoners have included General Electric Executives, <laughs> and Pete Seeger, a folk singer, who went to jail, right? And the judge said, do you have anything to say? No, but I'd like to sing something. No. No, no. <laughs> Pete Seeger, uh, anyway, he went to jail for contempt of Congress. 
and the General Electric executives went because of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So, you know, if you're a genuine, red-blooded, all-American burglar in the yard during the recreation period, you know, how does this feel? You're saying, you're saying, what are you in for? Trying to make friends? And the guy says, contempt of Congress. And, uh, I'd see you move away. <laughs> what are you in for? I, 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 well, uh, I, uh, Sherman Antitrust Act. Well, listen, uh, you sound trustworthy. Uh, some of us are kind of planning a crash out. I wouldn't try it. See those lights up there? Well, we're worried about the guns. And I want to tell you about the lights. <laughs> uh, sure. so, anyway, I... Uh, in the words of the General Electric executives, <laughs> progress is our most important product. 